not everybody's here yet, still may show up some, but we can go ahead and call the meeting to order for Tuesday, February 18th, 2020. Uh, like always, the first thing we have to do is approve the agenda. Uh, is there any ads or deductions? Or I make a motion. Wait, wait. Okay. Did you, I mean, something? did you have something, Bill? Yeah, I just want to add, um, uh, we need to talk about tax anticipation borrowing. Okay. And I would like to add liquor licenses for the village market. Fast Stop and Champlain Farms. The tax anticipation borrowing you can put at the end of my stuff. Say that again, Carla. Liquor licenses under consent agenda items for Village Market, Fast Stop, and Champlain Farms. Came in after I posted the agenda. Yeah, I was going to add, before making really a, a motion to add to the agenda, a short discussion at the end of our agenda to have uh, talk about po possibly using some uh, test, test strips on roads uh, to look at the use of uh, in installing foam. Um, okay. Uh, I'd also just like a five second discussion on coronavirus as well, just briefly. Um, I'm sorry, Carla, on that last, you got Village Market, Fast Stop, and what was the last Champlain one? Champlain Farms. Okay, is there anything else? All right, so, Seeing nothing else, if somebody wants to uh, approve the agenda as edited, I make a motion. I make a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Second. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Consent agenda items uh, consisting of the minutes of January 27th meeting, liquor licenses for Maplewood Convenience Store, Sunflower Natural Foods, Zen Barn, Vitality Mart, Cold Hollow Cider Mill, Kenny Drugs, Village Market, Fast Stop, and Champlain Farms, and a festival permit for the Rotary Club for an event on March 22nd at St. Leo's Hall. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. All right. All those who wish to approve it, please say aye. 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 Public, is there anybody here from the public that wishes to speak at this time? Does it look as though, even though we got a full house? Uh, so we'll jump right into Downtown Transportation Fund Grant, and that has to be you, Barb. How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know <clears throat> Thank you for having me tonight. Um, this is a grant that we had put in for in 2017, received $100,000 to go towards the um, improvements in the downtown once the Main Street project is done. Those improvements include wayfinding signs, um, five kiosks for the public as uh, visitors are coming into town, situational, where are they, they are here. This is a little history of the area, and then of their uh, different places in town will give different histories. Um, it includes uh, some park benches, it includes some bicycle racks, and um, it included plant arm uh, uh, holders so that the period lighting that's coming in as part of the main street <coughs> can now have uh, lamp post plant arm holders on. So those were all bid out. Uh, those were included in the 2017 grant. They were, <clears throat> if you remember, the Main Street project was behind a year because of, I think it was the contaminated soils issue. Um, so it was put back a year. So we're now into 2020. We need to burn off that, um, or spend all of that $100,000 in that grant. We've had a couple of things that were tweaked. But in that process between when we put the grant in three years ago and um, 
uh, last year when all the bids came in for the Main Street project. <clears throat> the cost for the kiosks came in higher than were anticipated. The cost for the wayfinding signs, directional signs, came in lower. And the cost for the plant arm hangers came in at a dollar a piece, <laughs> which was that they hadn't been spec'd out at all. So <clears throat> now that we're in 2020, um, those projects are going to be done, but we're left with a shortfall for the kiosks, which came in well over budget. Our net shortfall on that is um, $51,800, which is on, if, uh, did you all get the um, material that Carla sent out on Friday on the, uh, on the request? I'm looking at it right now here, yeah. yeah. So we're, uh, we're looking to seek um, phase two of the downtown transportation fund grant to fund um, the extra cost that we didn't know of when the, doc, when the grant first came out. We didn't have the opportunity to have the bid results in. Um, we're looking to add some additional um, trash and recycling receptacles that have been priced out by RW and the design committee. Um, the, we're looking at hanging plant baskets to go on those plant arm holders um, that RW will maintain. Um, throughout the summer. In the past, RW has had barrels, like half whiskey barrels, along the sidewalks on South Main, well, Main Street and then um, Stowe Street. So those barrels are no longer going to exist. Um, apparently, people use them for waste receptacles. Um, they were difficult to manage. They had found diapers in there and cigarette butts and cans and bottles. and um, So those aren't going to happen anymore. Um, we're looking at dog waste receptacles, extra, and one extra bike rack, and um, I put down here one extra park bench above what we had in the 2017 grant, and I was informed today, no, we're actually going to be putting in for two, so there will be an adjustment on that. Um, the grant is due March 9th, and um, we would like to include, it'll now be in the ballpark of $69,800 to include those items. The match that is required as uh, for this grant, <clears throat> we can use the Main Street project as a match or a portion of it. And what we used in 2017 that everybody agreed upon, we had a signed letter from the state, were 10 lamp posts. And uh, 10 lamp posts were estimated by Stantec to be to cost a, approximately $10,000 a piece. So 10 lamp posts times $10,000 is $100,000, which is what we put in for our uh, match last time around. So we would like to. Um, we are having more lamp posts, so we'd like to include those as a match again. So I need to uh, request that you tell me what what it was we are out getting now because of the diapers and all that? Uh, we are it has getting nothing to do with the grants. Baskets. Okay. Yeah. Um, so are we still getting the five uh, recycling receptacles? Yes. So this is what we'd like to request in this grant application for 2020. So what Barb my question said, about the recycling. What Barb said was going away were the whiskey barrel planters okay. that we currently have used for they're going away. Years. We're not going to be putting those out anymore. So it's not something that's coming out of the grant. The planters that are in the grant will replace, if you will, those. Yes. So my question was just, you know, five trash recycling receptacles, and that's 2000 bucks a piece. They're nice ones. I was going to say, they better be. <laughs> what they are are they're dual, they're metal, and solid metal, and they get um, screwed into the ground. Oh. And they're uh, one trash barrel for recycling, one trash barrel for garbage. They're, I do have a picture of it, so you can see. And the other question is the 51800 That's that's the cost overrun just for the wayfinding signs? Yes. You know what? For the kiosks. Those are the kiosks. Not right? the wayfinding signs, the kiosks. Oh, it just says for wayfinding signs, for well, kiosks and wayfinding signs. Right. What it is, it's from the net cost overrun. So right. 
Wayfinding signs were less, the kiosks were more. That's the net Understood. overrun. Yeah. And I don't have a picture of that. I've got a picture of the hanging flower basket and dog waste receptacle and bench, but not just trash. Barb, there's no way to request from the grantee uh, an amended application for the additional overrun or the 100,000 was capped? The 100,000 was the maximum that we maximum. for 2017. Okay. So <clears throat> the way that this particular grant fund works, they do fund um, phased projects, so you might get with a cap of $100,000. Mm -hmm. So they fully anticipate that you, know, you might come back in to finish a project in the subsequent year. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? No, I would just comment that I'm on the design committee for revitalizing Waterbury, and we've been talking about trash and recycling for containers for over 10 years, maybe 15. So I'm very excited that we're finally going to get them. Yeah. All right. If there's no more questions or comments. You, you won't be on the board next year when we're talking about how much more money we have to put in the budget to empty the trash and recycling containers. So. <laughs> I think that's a new job for you. I think she planned that out. Well, I'm sure you. I'm sure you'll do a, a very good job evaluating. <laughs> so, if somebody would love to make a motion to approve the. Um, Application for the Downtown Transportation Fund Grant, uh, as written by Barb. I, I will make a motion to approve the uh, amendment, or as written. The application. The application, as described. And somebody be so kind to second that? Second. <clears throat> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. And as a second part of that, um, um, there's another page there. It's a resolution for the Downtown Transportation Fund grant. It, uh, what it requires is that the Planning Commission had also reviewed the application. They did uh, about two or three weeks ago. And they, on the, um, theirs was on the 27th of January. And so um, Ken Bellavo is the chair of the Planning Commission signed off. And so now the grant source also ask that the select board um, approve the resolution for the downtown transportation fund and authorize Bill to sign the application. So would somebody like to make that motion then, please? I'll make that motion. The resolution. The resolution. Yeah. Thank you. And authorize Thank you. Bill to sign it. Yeah. Is there a oh. second? Bill's going to sign the grant. You have to sign the resolution, right? Correct. The motion is to sign the re approve. signing the resolution. Second. Any further discussion? Okay. All those who wish to approve, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. And Carla, you have the original. Yeah, it's going around. Okay, great. So if you could just sign that, and we'll date it. And That's uh, thank resolution. you very much. Thanks for coming in, Barb. Okay. Always a pleasure to see you. Yeah, it's always good to come <laughs> in. Uh, just to, can I give you just a quick update on the uh, Absolutely. Uh, Main Street project? Uh, there will be a handout available on town meeting day, um, and that handout will basically say the Main Street uh, reconstruction project is about to start up again in April-ish. It depends on the weather. Um, there's a public meeting scheduled for, it's, unfortunately it's on St. St. Patty's Day, um, the 17th, and it will be in this room, and it starts at 6 o'clock at night, so it'll be 6 to 8, and then we'll let everybody go off and drink green beer. Um, but VTrans will be here, the contractor will be here, and they'll give an update of really what to expect in year two. They're moving in closer into the core of the downtown, so there's going to be a lot of juggling and um, probably a lot of merchants that are nervous about how accommodations might be made for businesses, but the, the uh, contractors and VTrans have really made accommodations to try to make it as best as possible. Yeah. Well, the locals will have to really step up and uh, come visit their local businesses. Are they ahead of schedule? 
So in the big scheme of things, with a two and a half year construction timeline, um, they made some great progress last year and they're ahead of schedule on some items and they're hoping to have another excellent year at it, but it depends really how the weather goes, it depends on any you know, uh, uh, restrictions that the business core may say, we really don't want you to work during the day, you have to work at night. Um, if Mark Fryer were here, he'd say you can't work at night, you have to work during the day. So there's, there's going to have to be a lot of juggling and figuring out how to best do this. So that may put them back onto their normal you know, timeline of June 31st. But in the last year, a year from now, they'll be doing landscaping and touch-ups. Okay. okay. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thanks again, Barbara. Well, it's not 7.30 yet. Yeah, we're a little early there, so maybe we can jump to something different here. Um, appropriate to go through town meeting motions now? Or I would we'll... wait for Jeff to be here for that. Okay, and uh, that's why I asked. Yep. Certificate of highway mileage, that's yep. a pretty simple one. We can do that. <clears throat> um, so municipalities are supposed to certify uh, their highway mileage, class one, two, three, uh, and for mileage, um, for whatever reason, on you know certificate of mileage for the year ending February 10th. I don't know why they picked February 10th, but that's the, the date. So we have had no changes in 2019 from March 1st. I mean from from February 11th, 19 through uh, February 10th this year. We've had no no changes. We have uh, 1.492 miles of class one, 7.94 miles of class two, 39.61 class three, um, <clears throat> and then the state has 18.462, which must include the interstate. Um, and then we have 6.59 of class four uh, miles. We have no scenic highways as designated through the AOT process. So um, I would just ask if you would uh, make a motion to approve this, and then you have to sign it as a kind of a heads up. <coughs> um, There's two pages, right? I have a question. Uh, Did you say we have no scenic highways? That's right. What about the scene? What about that's 100? State. That's a state highway. Oh, OK. So no town roads are scenic. No towns, towns are designated as a scenic highway. Um, we will have a few changes next year. Uh, Bill Woodruff talked to me last week. Uh, we're not including them in, in this mileage certificate. But um, the state wants a better delineation of where the road is that goes to the ice center, specifically. You know, you've got the town road that goes down to the ice center, and then there's a there's a parking lot, but then there's the roadway that was for the old dump, and and all the way down to the cemetery uh, goes out beyond the parking lot into what we use as a material storage area. So they want to better delineate what is and is not highway there, and then there's a few other small changes, but those are for those are for next year, so we'll deal with those a year from now. Okay. There you go. So if somebody's interested in doing so, we can uh, take a motion to approve the certificate of highway mileage as presented by Bill for 2020. I'll make a motion to approve the certificate of highway as described by Bill. Second the motion. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those who wish to approve, say aye. 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 <coughs> you have to sign both pages. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you want to wait for, probably don't need to wait for Jeff on the date of the next regular meeting, right? No, we can talk about that now. <coughs> so um, your next regularly scheduled meeting, according to the calendar, is March 2nd. The, the night before town meeting, 
Uh, we're going to review the motions tonight. Um, I'm not sure, you know, there will be no more changes. Um, Carla's not able to be here on the second because the election is ongoing. She's got certain things to set up. So uh, I think in the past couple of years, we haven't had a meeting, or did we have one? I think one year you did, one year you didn't. So it's, it's really your choice, but um, it used to be that we would go over the motions the night before town meeting, but that's before we started inviting Jeff, the moderator, to come to the meetings and have a conversation with us. So it's either March 2nd or March 16th, and it's really your choice. Well, I don't know how the town meeting will go. Last year we were there for many hours, so I wouldn't. Of course, this is, that would mean this would be my last um, select board meeting. It'd be okay with me if we didn't have one on the first. I can't understand why, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> could go either either way I don't know if, if we feel that we're ready after meeting with the moderator tonight maybe we could punt I don't know if there's you know I'm all able and willing to meet on that Monday but I think it's what happens probably tonight if we feel we're ready for a town meeting you can come back to it you, you can decide yeah, after, after Jeff leaves if you want probably so. after yeah i was going to ask fine. that earlier see what we how we feel at the end of the meeting that's why i didn't know if I... okay i'll put that one on hold now i guess um you want to just jump into the coronavirus discussion real quick Sure. <laughs> Can hardly wait. Bill says whatever. Um, I just wanted to bring it to the board's attention. Um, I've been kind of keeping an eyeball on what's been going on in that. I don't know if the rest of you have as well, but uh, it seems like it's been pretty tough to contain, um, even with the fact that you know the medical uh, support teams are wearing all the gear that they're wearing. It still seems to be being passed on and now that they've brought home the Americans into the U.S. Uh, I'm curious to know the, the percentage of risk of uh, that taking off here and uh, didn't know if at some point, keep an eye on this, if we should be contacting Homeland Security to find out what their game plan is on this thing. Um, Hopefully they're, they've got an eye on it as well. And uh, I just want to try to be proactive on it. It may end up subsiding and going away completely here within the next month or two, but I think it's an important enough issue and the fact that it seems to be a pretty big killer uh, that we should do our due Wouldn't diligence. Wouldn't the Vermont stay Department of Health be the first place you would check? Or? both places um, Homeland Security and Department of Health would be the two gateway places and I think they're going to notify us control I think the only issue could be is if we have someone who travels overseas and winds up contracting the disease that's a Waterbury resident that may put us on a higher state of alert but I'm not I mean I see the news I pay attention to it as much as anybody I think um, it's certainly concerning I heard today that you know that the death rate for coronavirus is 2% versus 0.1% for the flu it's just that so many more people get the flu that you know it kills uh, you know 60,000 people or 600 whatever the number was but I'm, I'm not sure us contacting the Department of Health or Homeland Security makes any sense. We have, we have no role in it. We, 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 are not, we don't operate a medical facility. Um, we don't operate an ambulance. Uh, we have a fire department that are first responders. But, you know, I, I think it's reasonable be, to be concerned, but, and I'm not saying it's not our problem, but 
what are we going to do with whatever information we get that we don't have anything, any role to play? No, I, I, the only thing I guess I was asking is should we somehow make them aware of the fact that, that we have concern of it, just to make sure that find out where they are on it, you know, uh, just an informational thing whether or not they, they think that it's, uh, it, it is premature. I know I'm bringing this to the table a little prematurely, but again, uh, based on what I've been seeing, uh, and maybe it's just the media that's, that's overplaying it, but uh, it seems like there's been a fair share of deaths out of it, and uh, just trying to but, be proactive and stay on top of. Proactive to do what? What do we do with the information they give to us? You know, Bill, I, I really don't know. Yeah. Well, uh, so I don't know. I mean, it's... They'll probably tell us what to do. If there's something... I guess I, that's the question I'm asking. I mean, Will if, they... You know, if, we had people that, and... if we had people in our town who had traveled to China and they come back here, they need to, you know, put themselves in quarantine for two weeks, that kind of thing. But, I mean, do we have any residents who... How would I know? We have no control over that. How would I know? How there was would we, how a, there was a woman um, interviewed on the radio who was had been in China, and she's in New York, um, across the lake, and um, she she had put herself. Uh, she wasn't sick. She doesn't have any symptoms, but she put put herself in quarantine, working from home. She's a professor at State University in New York, so she was just doing that for two weeks to be cautious and. That kind of thing, but yeah, it was just a conversation, Bill. That's all. Yeah, you know, I, I was understand. looking to try to stay on top top of something that seemed to be uh, uh, potentially getting out of hand. Um, they've suggested that it may end up being a pandemic, and but whatever. Um, I personally am going to keep an eye on it. But okay, we got our star here for the night. Uh, so you've been. Uh, We've been kind of working around your slot there, Jeff. So if uh, you're ready, you can come on up and give us what for. Glad to have you. Well, it's that time of year. It is. <laughs> Pleasure to hear your dulcet tones at town meeting. I don't have any new words of wisdom to offer. I think each of you has heard what I've had to say many, many, many times. Um, I just want to stress that town meeting is the meeting that belongs to the residents of the town. It's their meeting to find out what's going on. Uh, ask questions and aside from that that's the only spiel that I have to give so I'll just to make your time here a little more interesting I'll throw a, a question in your lap um, I haven't read Robert's rules yet this year <laughs> hopefully I haven't changed you could probably do it by far <laughs> um, the resolution here uh, for the uh, climate change initiative um, I guess where do you see that going and how into the weeds do you think this could get so just to as a preamble to Jeff, we're talking about Article 9, mm -hmm. right, Chris? Correct, mm -hmm. correct, yeah. And just to be clear, Article 9, um, the select board agreed to put the article on the warning uh, rather than making uh, several interested citizens go out and get a petition. They were here back in November, December, talked about it. Um, they were willing to, you know, work with me uh, and we kind of crafted this language, but I just want, I, I, so we're all on the same page. My take on Article 9 is that this is not a proposal the select board are 
necessarily going to make the motion for. This, this I expect, at least in my mind, was a, a, a motion that the select board, I mean an article the select board agreed to put on the warning, not requiring a petition, but this is not a select board resolution. I'd like to bet on motion. Okay. Somebody else is going to make that motion. Okay. Has someone been duly appointed to do that? No, it's up. It's up to the. It's up to the public. It's not our. Uh, I know it's not our responsibility, but. Uh, I thought I had removed the motion from your script, but. I no. No. It does say to see if the town will direct the select board to establish a committee, et cetera. Right, <laughs> but to Chris's point, uh, you know, I think Chris is trying to get, you know, what are we going to say? But I'm not sure if Kathleen Day makes this motion, you would typically ask her if she wanted to speak mm -hmm. to the motion, right? Mm -hmm. And then from there it goes to the broader audience and conceivably the select board if they want to engage in the dialogue, but they don't have to, do right? They? Well, I think in the, the, the way town meeting works, the way that I've always run town meeting is, um, I'd say something like, Article 9, see if the town will direct the select board to establish com a committee to assess municipal officials and staff to implement the energy plan for the town of Waterbury which was adopted by the select board on December 3rd, 2018. What is your pleasure with respect to Article 9? And then I'll look and see if someone raises their hand. And if no one does, and this, and I will say, this is sort of some difficulty that I have with the motions on uh, 11 through 19, is you're not obligated to move something just because it appears on the warning. And so I'll look around the room after I say, what's your pleasure with respect to Article 9? And there will be potentially, unless someone is right on top of it, there will be a fairly pregnant pause. And I can think of at least two <laughs> members of the, of the town that will be at the meeting that will simply move it because nobody else has. But they're not obligated to. Certainly, you're not obligated to. And so someone will raise their hand and say, Mr. Moderator, and I'll say, Ms. or Mr. And they'll say, hopefully they have a copy of the motion. But if not, we'll sort of we'll work them through it. And they'll make a motion. And hopefully, for con merely for convenience sake, it'll be something that's pretty close to what we have here. But it doesn't have to be. It, they can move just about anything that they want. And depending upon how vague it is or how specific it is, you know, I may help them. I may have some comments. I may say, is there a second? And then if someone moves it, then we'll move into the discussion. And again, there's absolutely no obligation on your part to say a word. Um, you, it, you may, as individuals, have, want to speak to it. You may, as on behalf of the board, want to speak to it. I don't know what your position is. But I think the only thing that I would say to you folks who are sitting up front is that even more importantly than any other items that are on the warning, this belongs to them because they have requested that it go on the warning. And so I would suggest that you let everybody out there have their say, and then you can jump in. Doesn't, you don't have to, but I would, I would, I would, if you want to say something, then I would just request that you be very cautious to play by the rules and not simply jump in because you're a member of the select board, which happens on, you know, some of the motions with respect to budgets. And I think that's, 
that's understandable because you have a certain degree of knowledge that they don't have out there. But let them do it. Let them carry the discussion. And we all know who the handful of people are that will move to limit debate if it goes on and on and on. And you know who they are, I know who they are. We set forth at the beginning of the meeting until you're recognized by the moderator, you can't simply shout out, I move to limit debate. So when I see those handful of people start getting antsy, I'll look to, I'll look to you folks if you haven't talked yet and see if there's anything that you have to say. Jeff, one quick question. Sure. If we want to, after some of this, um, if there's sufficient discussion out there and we want to respond, say as an individual, do we step down from the dais and do that or? I think that's however you feel comfortable doing it. You can always preface your remarks by saying, just because I'm sitting up here on the dais doesn't mean what I am about to say reflects anything that the town or the select board may have in mind, and then go on from there. Or if you think that it's more appropriate for you to go around, that's fine too. That's fine too. So a question when you, when you talk about um, letting the public have their say, um, what if during a portion of the conversation that one individual or another may bring up, if there is a question or a possible response from a board member before the conversation gets left behind and way into the weeds on something else, do we have the opportunity to respond before it becomes old? You know what I mean? I, I think you can. And again, I, we've had this conversation with the board a lot. I think you can, but I recommend, strongly recommend, that unless someone has a specific question of the board, you wait until it's your turn, stale or not, to give an answer to that question. Because a lot of what people say when they're talking, they ask it in the form of a question, but it's purely a rhetorical question. They're not necessarily fishing for an answer. Because a lot of people will phrase their perspective when they're trying to advocate for a position in the form of a question, and you know simply by the question how they feel, and they're not necessarily asking for a response. Yeah. And so I would, it, I would urge you to exercise some restraint. And then raise your hand. And I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that, that you can't raise your hand and, well, you're the next hand up, so I'll call on you. But if there are three or four others, I may go one, two, three, four, and it's not going to be stale. I mean, I think you realize probably a, a topic like this could become fairly extensive uh, based on what I understand from people's concern about it. Um, so I just didn't know. You know, I think before we go off the deep end, I mean, what they're asking for is a committee to look at the town's energy plan and, and, and see if we can come up with some ideas that are in sync with the state of Vermont's energy plan. You know. Jane, I was just simply asking how far I know, into this kind of conversation should we allow it to go? Well, you folks have known me for I don't know how many years. And you know that unless someone really veers off topic, I feel philosophically it's important for them to have their say. And the one, the issue that I think of the most and smile the most about is the meeting that we had on the gun control issue. And 
I can't tell you the number of people that came up to me after the meeting and said two things. One is, thank you for the discussion. And the other was, we appreciate your position on gun control. And I'm going, what? <laughs> I, I said that to myself. Because a lot of these people thought, because I was letting the conversation go, I had a particular position. And nothing could have been further than the truth. But I think the reward for doing that was people felt like they were heard. They didn't particularly like the way I ultimately ruled on it, but they still felt like they were heard, and that's why it's important to let them talk. And as I said, unless we really veer on course, off course, I'll tend to let people have their say. And I also know, and we all know, who those five, six, or seven people are that are out there that will keep me on track by trying to get acknowledged so they can limit debate. And it's sort of a game we play. But it's important to let people, if, they want, if people want to wallow in the weeds, as frustrating as it can be, if people want to wallow in the weeds, my feeling is it's their meeting. Let them wallow. Yeah, if they show up, you know, I think I'm speculating that yeah. a fair amount of people will show up simply because of this article. Uh, that being the case, I think they're, ob you know, we're obligated to allow them reasonable time without becoming re ridiculously redundant. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm not afraid to say I think we've heard that comment before. And I remember, again, another meeting very specifically, it was the very first item on the agenda. We barely elected the moderator, and we, start, we had the police debate. And we had something like 500 people at that meeting. And that was some of the best civilized adult conversation that I've heard in a public meeting. And wish we could have more of it. Yeah. Yeah. That was the second police debate, right? The first that one was, was the, the one debate. that they <laughs> yeah. just yeah, moved the table it and the <laughs> yeah, that, building right. Right. That was the Yeah, that was the second one. Yeah. The state police, yeah. Yes. That was good. So to your point, Jane, I guess I'm going to question why, um, you know, as little or as well as I think I might know you, um, you, I have to think that this particular article is something of great interest to you. I didn't say that. I just. What? I, I don't. I, I just got the impression that you were no, I just don't interested in chopping just, it to a committee and and letting it go from there. Uh, well, I think. No, I just re I've just read the what the motion is, and I it doesn't. I mean, I. I I feel like what I'm sensing from you is that you think this could get really out of control. No, no, I'm a, I'm actually happy to have and the I'm conversation. I'm reading this and I'm thinking I, I I'm saying to myself we have, I better familiar familiarize myself with both the town's energy plan and the state state of Vermont's comprehensive energy plan. Just probably be helpful just to know what's in them and I, I don't know just see this where this goes. So well, just, I guess um, I thought you're. I thought your point, Jane, was that the only thing that the public is going to know is when they is reading the warning. Yeah. Article 9 just asks if the board will establish a committee to assist in implementing the energy plan. This motion that They won't see the here, whole the second nobody, part at nobody all. Nobody has that. You know, right. I mean, I'm not saying nobody knows anything about it, but uh, if if you read the the warning, mm -hmm. It doesn't say anything about climate change. It doesn't say anything about, you know, yeah. um, how we're going to maintain it the It pretty road. much, it, when, it just when asked Jeff the, just read it, it pretty much concluded on the third line after the town of Waterbury. You said the date, December 3rd, the town adopted. The, yeah, that's what the warning plan. says. That's yeah. what the warning says. I mean, I can, the, the usual way, the, the way the voters of Waterbury are accustomed 
to doing these things, especially if they haven't seen the motion, is I think what you're going to get is Mr. Moderator, Mr. Moderator, I move that the town direct the select board to establish a committee and read the rest of the warning. And I'll say, okay, did you have anything specific in mind? Well, mm, guess I hadn't thought about that. A committee for what? <laughs> so, I'm, so I'm a little confused. Just maybe I, it's just been a while, but um, the, the second two thirds of this, all about the similar goals and be it resolved and um, basing on the town's energy plan, is that's been written up here um, as just for our information? Is that the no, actual so, motion? What's so going that, on here? I, we think there's a high degree of likelihood that from what's in italics on your page, right. from I move to the, the town's plan, the expectation is somebody who was here in November asking for this motion, this article to be on the warning will make the motion. And it's pretty likely this is going to be the motion. I sat with three of them. And you know, ex when they were here that day, yeah. and you may have been here that, were you here that mm -hmm. day? No? Um, you know, Kathleen Day, her initial motion, or her initial statement was something like, and the town will do everything it can to prevent you know, climate change or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, if you make a motion like that, that, that's pretty broad because what's everything? You know, does it mean if there's a uh, all electric yeah. uh, you know, tandem dump truck out there that costs $500,000 that we have to buy it? Mm -hmm. So they agreed to come in. And so there were three or four of them that sat down oh, okay. and this is what they came up with. Now, if Jeff recognizes the wrong person, there may be a different motion yeah. on the, on the yeah. floor. Yeah. And but then yeah, we don't know who the right person is. You know, there may be okay. an amendment after that. Yeah. 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 To, to me, this is very innocuous. I think what's here is fine. And I'm kind of in Bill's court is, uh, that's my concern being on the board is getting something that's so unwieldy that the town directs us to buy the $500,000 dump truck where we can get a $200,000 dump truck. Uh, you know, I think we're going to take anything, anything in reason. I think we can look at renewable alternatives in our operations, but I don't think it's a good policy to have the board bound by saying absolutely, you know, these absolutes. And that's would that be my concern depending upon how it's presented the mo the motion if the motion kind of if it's what we're seeing here is a sample motion i think that's fine well we can give jeff a heads up on who we think might be raising their hand well i think through the conversation it'll be you know these specific things that concerns that you just mentioned and what bill just mentioned will be pointed out and people are reasonable enough to understand that we can't handcuff ourselves to costs that we can't afford uh, and that will, you know, certainly uh, do everything in our capable hands to uh, help with this issue any other way we can besides bankrupting ourselves. Well, let me just, let me just play out a scenario for you. Um, I, rep I, I recognize someone and someone says, well, Mr. Moderator, I move that the town instruct the members of the select board to purchase only electric vehicles regardless of the cost. That's the motion, okay? Someone quickly goes, a second? And I'll think about it for a minute <laughs> <laughs> to see if that's a motion that I feel that I can accept. All right, because it has to be germane to the to the article on the warning, and germane is fairly broad. And so let's say that I allow the motion as seconded, and we have some discussion. Um, 
you're going to get some people that are out there. Now, do you really mean that the next dump truck that the town buys has to be $3 million? And if someone out there doesn't, certainly Chris is going to ask the question just to make the comment. And this is what I mean, you know, when some people will ask a question and it really is a comment. And you say to the person that made the motion, do you really think that this town can afford to spend $3 million on an electric grader? I don't even know if they exist, but I assume that they probably do. Um, you stated in the form of a question what your position is, and the townspeople are going to get some idea that, OK, well, that's the next 10 years worth of capital budgeting. And perhaps it doesn't mean that. And then is anybody open to some kind of an amendment or, a, or some clarification on what the motion would be? This is fairly new, or if not new, somewhat unique to the town of Waterbury because we don't have a lot of motions in this community on political activities, which is what, what this is heading towards. Motions on political activity, like, you know, you, you name the issue, we don't have a lot of, and that can get into some pretty interesting... Well, gun control. <laughs> gun control. Some pretty interesting discussion. And we just have to see where it goes. Yeah. And, you know, you, not so much you folks as the folks out there, but you vote too. You know, you're trusting that the moderator is going to keep this railroad on the tracks for the duration of the meeting. And we'll see where it goes, as they say. But well, it's, going it, to, it's going to make for an enjoyable meeting. Sure. No, and I'm looking forward to it, actually. Um, and I was just looking at how the article's positioned and what came after it. Um, article 10 is, unless I'm missing something. Uh, that's it's the that's, first of the special articles. That's the end of the line, right? Yeah. Um, well, there, there's, there's a number after Article 10, but they're all, they're all special articles. 10 is just the, Right, yeah, the, I understand. The one with the... Goes to what? 15, 20? 19, 20. 20. I just didn't print that page. But they're all okay. just consisting of special article right. items. Yeah. Uh, so at that point in the game, this Article 9 and this uh, topic is uh, kind of positioned right so that people aren't bound who don't want to be involved in this article to stay unless they've got some uh, attachment to one of these uh, special articles. If people don't believe that there's an issue or don't have time or don't want to talk about this, mm -hmm. won't miss anything else important for the prior articles because we've already, we'll have already gone through those. So that's, that's good the way that, that the, this was stuck in here. And this is sort of gratuitous on my part, but if I'd been here when you were putting the warning together, and if you'd asked me, I would have said, let's put Article 9 at the very end and keep people here and maybe help the folks that are serving dinner get some more patrons. Do you need to put it You're after right. Article 10? Well, There's seven no. more articles. No, put it after Article, just before Article 19. Yeah. Article 18.5. But I'm wondering just how many people. That's why I say I think yeah. it's positioned well because I think once we get to the special articles, you see a lot of people exit because they oh, say. Oh, I know. That's why I'm saying it would be nice to have it at the, towards the end so oh, that they'll I stay. What you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And that was one of the biggest criticisms of the gun control thing because it wasn't warned. And it was an important piece that all of a sudden cropped up out of nowhere. With well, I mean, six or seven people left in the audience. This, at that point, I, I still think it's well positioned because uh, oh, I'm not, not everybody you. has to stay for the special articles, obviously. Um, but I do think they'll stay for this. And uh, at least it's timed in this game that people aren't wore out by then. 
you know, I think by the time you get through 10 to 20 special articles, they're like had enough, but, um, so yeah, I, I'm happy where it is. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm looking forward to, to the discussion. Just a question that I have on um, Article 8. Have you decided which one you're going to move? Because I noticed that the second yeah, format I was, I was is actually wondering that too, slightly if, different than what we've yeah. seen in the past. You would go but through that bill. Can we just go through all of them? From sure. The sure. Yeah. And Carla would like to do that. Okay. Uh, do I need to read them off, or what would you like, Bill? You just need to assign. Oh. People that are going to make the motions. Draw straws. Uh, Mark's not here. <laughs> Why is it always when we go to do this? There's an odd man out. Odd man out here. Um, like I've said in the past, you guys pick whatever you want, and I'll take up the slack. I don't get one way or another. I think they're all important. And, yeah, know, I mean, who, who wants who Article wants 1? I'll take it. Uh, I'll start to start the game off. Um, Article 2? 4. Articles two and three, and we'll pass over. Oh, that's over. right, two. I'll do four. I'll do four. Uh, oh, no, five. no, I'll do five. I'm sorry. Matt's doing four? I'll do yeah. four. Bill does five. I'll do six. Who's doing six? I'll do six. I'll do seven. Mark will do eight. Okay, now oh, you, thanks, Mark. We can talk about which one. Okay. Mark. <laughs> yeah. So Article 8 is the budget article. Uh, in years past, we have done 8 first and then what is listed as 7 second. But um, <clears throat> Carla and I talked about it, and I think it's better to do 7 first because if, for whatever reason, the, the town decides it doesn't want to borrow, it may impact how much you want to sp spend. So Article 7 is for the capital improvement plans, the capital projects, uh, which includes an amount not to exceed $300,000 to finance the expenditures. Article 8, um, the traditional way that we have voted a budget is the first one here where we, someone moves to spend a certain amount of money for general expenses and the special articles, and then a, an amount for highways and an amount for library, and then uh, those special reserve funds, and at the end that the select board be authorized to issue bills for property taxes in the sum of 4142000 uh, plus what's voted on in Articles 10 through 18. That's the traditional way that we've done it. And what you get that way is a definite amount of uh, tax dollars that you're going to raise. And then come July, when we set the grand list, you take that amount of money and you divide it by whatever the grand list is, and it comes out to a tax rate. We think the tax rate's going to be about 55 cents. If you do the second option here, which we did uh, at least one year, the year after the flood, we actually set a tax rate on the grand list as opposed to a set dollar amount because um, we knew the grand list was going to be dropping. Uh, we had a reasonable expectation and we were hoping that we would actually raise a little bit more money uh, to help us build a, a, a fund balance if we set a tax rate rather than the, the tax amount. So during the discussion that you had a couple of meetings ago, when you decided that you wanted to have um, 
you know, borrow a little bit less than I had proposed and a tax rate of a, of a four cent increase. Um, if you decide that you want to rate, that you want to have a tax rate of 55 cents, up to 55 cents, you can say it that way if you want to. Um, whatever the grand list is, you multiply it by 55 cents and you come up with money. And my, I couldn't tell the other day when we met whether you were hoping that we could raise this amount of money and that you were hoping for a higher grand list so the tax rate could be a little bit lower, or if you were saying, uh, we want a four cent tax increase because we want to put money into the coffers for next year because the budget, as we have proposed it this year, especially in the capital funds, uh, you know, we don't, we don't have to borrow anywhere near $300,000 if we're going to spend $2,281,000 in Article 7 and break even. The borrowing of $300,000 financing some of the projects and the equipment will allow us to have a fund balance of some reasonable amount going into next year. So it's really your choice. If you choose the first option, then you're basically saying if the grandness grows more than we think it might, our tax rate might be 54 cents or 54 and a half cents instead of 55. If you want a 55 cent tax rate, regardless of the grand list, then you do the second one. It doesn't make any difference to me. We have used both in the past. So Article 7 right now establishes a fund balance of what going into next year? In the capital funds, um, Yeah, something like that. About 272, 270, somewhere in the 270 range, Chris, 272, 500, I think. So, you know, and that's why I, I said before, if the voters authorize the spending in, in Article 7, but say, oh, we only want you to borrow 100,000 or, or nothing, you can still pretty much do everything that you wanted to do. You just would go into the, the year after that with nothing in the bank. So the uh, Article 8 is just meant so you can have flexibility. And I don't care which one you do. The, the dollar amount one is the one that we normally do, but we have done taken the option to set a tax rate on the grand list uh, at least once and maybe twice after I read. Bill, if Let's say someone um, amended Article 7 because someone from the board is going to move it. Right. If someone amended Article 7 so that it read not to exceed $100,000, yep. then would it not make sense then to move the second article? I would think so. So you so wait and t wait and see what if anything happens to Article Seven before you make the decision to go with the first one or the second one. Yeah, that's. So you're saying leaving those two as an option until that Article Seven has been settled. Right. right, and I think I think that's a good suggestion, but I also think it's helpful right now to get your sense of what you're hoping for. Mm. I couldn't tell after the last meeting. I were you think, wanting the tax rate right. to go up four cents, or were you simply saying 
would prefer the tax rate to go up a little bit more than I had recommended at the meeting, which was between two and three cents, and I had some more borrowing. So what you have to settle amongst yourself right now is, are you hoping to have a budget and have the lowest tax rate possible to allow that budget to work? And if that's the case, you want to do the first option. If you want to have the tax rate go up four cents, even if you only needed 3.2 cents, you would take the second option. I guess I'm, I lean towards going with the lowest tax rate possible. So if the grand list allowed it, you could have a lower tax rate. You could get the money from that. I have my opinion, but I'll wait to hear from everybody else first. I don't my, my, my thought uh, originally was that um, we kind of split the difference between borrowing and asking. Um, you know, either when you set a 55 cent tax rate, that's a, you know, that's an ask. And then a borrowing uh, on, on top of that is, is just something that we're asking permission to do. Um, and I thought when we were talking about that five cent or six cent or whatever it was, um, I think that was kind of a middle of the road. It certainly won't get us up to where we would need to be able to get ahead on a lot of the projects we want to get ahead on. But it was, um, it was using our financial position, which is pretty good right now. I mean, we're, we're, we're financially in a really good position in this town. So we have um, borrowing capabilities. But, you know, it's, it's, it's also within our purview to have an ask. <laughs> so that, that was... So which one are you so suggesting? Yeah. <laughs> the second one. Okay. Right. Was and, the one that I was... And, and, the, and the second one is worded so it still allows the board to hedge its bets because it says... Uh, a tax rate on the town's grand list not to exceed 55 cents per hundred. So in July, circumstances change. You could say, well, you know, the grand list is this. It's going to, you know, what if, if the grand list goes up 3%? I'm hoping it goes up 1.5%, but I've done all my numbers on 1%. But if it far exceeds what we wanted to do, you know, if you did the second one, you could still ratchet it down. It's not to exceed, whereas the other one is you raise 4421000 or whatever it is, 142000 yeah. Flexibility, I think, was... Yeah, I'm with that. I, I always like flexibility. I think it gives the option to the board the most flexibility and is not rigid, and I think it's, it's, it's in our best interest to keep it up. So you, your opinion is the tiebreaker here, Chris. <laughs> well, I'm the tie maker. Uh, the tie maker. I, underst right? I understand kind of where we're at on our infrastructure problems, and I'm a little bit worried about you know what next year is going to bring as far as uh, having sufficient funds next year. I was hoping that when I made that comment about um, the grand list, hoping that it was going to be reasonably substantial, um, I guess to, to make the pain a little less on the 55 cents, but I'll be honest with you, to have, to have that surplus Add to this surplus of 270 fund balance going into next year is only going to make next year easier. Uh, I was kind of thinking that realistically, grand list would only be, you know, one and a half percent. It seems to run kind of that. Yeah, that I think it's. 
that's more likely, you know, one yeah. to one and a half. Yeah. Uh, and if we came out of this with additional funds from the grand list, put it in here, put it into next year's, you know, surplus, if that's what you want to call it, and uh, next year we may not, not have to ask for, for so much. So that means you're leaning toward the second option? Yeah, it sounds like it. Yep. Yep. Because and somebody may throw a wrench into, you know, any of this during town meeting. Uh, it's their call, obviously. This is what we're suggesting. Uh, but I think we've got good argument to uh, prove the reason we did what we did. So. Right. And, and you do have the option to have it less than 55 cents when it comes Wrap time to down. the sure. way it's written. You've, it doesn't yeah. have to be 55, right. not to exceed 55 cents. Yeah. In the however many years I've been as the moderator, I can't recall a time when the public has even amended this article much less voted it down. You know, I was just thinking once, about that the other day. Just once to add money for the recreation director. Oh, yeah, that's true. well that was going Bad the money. other way. That's right, right. that was going money. the other way. But you're right, to, to reduce it. Um, mm. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's funny because I was thinking about a scenario the other day that uh, I wouldn't mind happening. Uh, to see it happen, even though it ties into part of our add-on to the uh, agenda here tonight, the paving projects. Um, and I don't know that we need to talk about that right now, even though it, it plays into part of what this is all about. Uh, yeah, I was wondering to myself if somebody was going to say this is too damn much, you know. <coughs> my concern is this, and I'll say it right out. It's, it's my opinion that previous boards uh, didn't focus on the infrastructure problem because at the time it may not have been quite in the condition that it is now. Uh, but now it is in the condition that it is now. Mike and I took a ride today and took a look at some of our issues, and uh, it's concerning. Um, and I just hope that the townspeople are willing to, and I'm the first to not want to raise taxes. That's the, you know, I hate raising taxes, raising the tax rate. Uh, but like I've said before, we're in a situation that we don't have any escape route. We've got to face the problems that we're dealing with, and it's going to require money. And if we can manage it right and get through it, uh, hopefully we'll pay dividends on the other end by having either stabilized taxes or possibly we could hope for reduced taxes, tax rate. You know, that's everybody's wish to always, you never, very seldom see it happen. They're always going like this. It'd be nice to, I mean, we did. We had three years of stable tax rate, and we accomplished a lot. So we've got to, you know, the townspeople need to give themselves credit for at least that uh, short term of consistency. Uh, and, you know, I was warned actually by my daughter because we've had a, a discussion there when we were setting the tax rate at 45 cents for three years in a row there. She said, you're setting yourself up for a, a boot in the ass, you know. But at the time, we were managing to accomplish a great deal at that tax rate. So we weren't procrastinating on things that needed to be done by keeping that tax rate there. We were gaining substantial ground, uh, and it wasn't until we decided to really start to delve into facing our infrastructure problems that we now, and of course the police department, 
that was huge. But uh, delving That's into good. our infrastructure problems, which is requiring the additional funds. So, well, I'm glad you brought that up because you know Jeff alluded to it. But, um, and I think it's the best way for us to approach the public safety issue. But that police department is a, I mean, we were accomplishing a lot keeping the tax rate stable, allowing the village to take care of the, the public safety. And when we had to step up to the plate because the village went away to, to address that, well, that siphoned a whole bunch of money that could have gone into the infrastructure that you're concerned about. And it's hard to go, you know, whole hog, grab onto something brand new that's $365,000 and also ante up more for other things. So, you know, that kind of caused us to shift down into second gear again, so to speak, to kind of catch up a little bit. And, you know, we're, it's going to take a couple of years to, to see that level out, right? Because, you know, we're into the second full year of that now. But if that didn't happen, there's $365,000 that could have gone toward paving or bridges that we just can't do all at once because and, of that circumstance. And fortunately for us, the scenario came along that we were able to hire just the town uh, state police and not go into a full-blown right. police department with no facility to house them. We saved ourselves a ton of money. So we got, we drew, drew the, you know, the long straw in this case, uh, by not, by not. Uh, right. That's why I said it's it's the result. How we're dealing with it, I think, is the best scenario for us. But yeah. don't. When we're talking to the constituents out there about what's happened to the tax rate, and your desire for infrastructure, I'm not blaming it on the police, but it's just you need to kind of connect the dots and say, yeah, but we also had to bite off this element that we didn't ever have to deal with before. Right. That's part well, of and I think we, we bit it off at a substantially decreased amount. You know, that's the, that's the upside of that whole thing. Right. You know, we got out of that un, relatively unscathed. For now. Right. For now. For now. Right. Let's hope it stays that way. Going, <laughs> going back to the question, I think... Mike, is, um, are you... Uh, the red line there? You're not on there. Uh, you're okay, and could you move your hat off of? Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, I think the first option gives us no options. Uh, that's why I'm against really the first option. And I think we, as much as I'm for taxes being minimized and you know there are a lot there are a lot of people hurting in this town and I want to try to keep the tax rate minimal I think option two still gives us some flexibility whether we want to go low whether we want to increase and deal with some of the infrastructure problems so I think you know depending upon what revenues coming in and where we were at gives us so much more flexibility and so so based on that swinging back to Jeff's point is there a, a need to keep these two scenarios here because how do we decide well I, I think it's completely up to you if 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 I'm the okay board with feels options. one way or the other that you know op option two is better regardless of what happens on um, Article Seven, then just tell us now, and we don't we don't have to kind of keep the balls in the air. Option One gives us no fallback, and you know we're all going. Right, but just understand that Option One, you know, I've been here for thirty-one or thirty-two years, and except for one or two years, it's always been in the form of Option One. There's a good chance nobody even asks why are you setting a tax rate as opposed to a, a dollar amount, but just understand it's different than usual. I don't know if people, well, 
there may be some people, but I, you know, I think if it's presented the right way, I think it, I think option two goes a lot. It, it's a better way to run our budget. Okay. Yeah, I just, I guess I'm concerned about at, at the town meeting, depending on what happens with Article 7, if the board has to all, all of a sudden huddle to say, which one of these do we go with? That might be a little odd. Uh, so just take two. So I think we'll just take two and, and uh, because I think the biggest question will be call it the amount of borrowing. That's going to be, I think, the $10 million question. Okay, I can live with that. One more for Article 10. So Five. Article 9 is hopefully the public. Um, We're assuming that. I can confirm with them. I'll do Article 10. That's a lot of talking. I, know, I love to talk. Okay. <laughs> I think it would be good for you now. We, we noticed. <laughs> <laughs> you said it, I didn't, but good one. Well, now you get your chance. Yeah. Yeah. In front of a whole gymnasium full of people. Okay. Great. Well, that's great. Good. Thank you. Thanks for coming in as always, Jeff, and uh, look forward to see you there Tell me and Good. Drive so, home safe. Yeah, it's really greasy. Yes. It's getting bad. Tough sledding getting here. Um, Article 8, then we're going to take out the first option and just I'll go with... I'll bring you fresh copies, town meeting day. Already. Uh, I, I have a question about the energy plan, the town energy plan which I know is not going to be in the movement, in the uh, Article 9, uh, but it's on our website, the town's website. Yeah, I think it's part of the town plan. It's part of the town plan. Yeah, it's part okay. of the municipal plan. Yeah. I was trying to find it on my phone. <laughs> Thank you. So we're all set with that then? Yep. Okay, good. Uh, i try to figure out where we are here. Uh, so you were... I guess we're on the manager's items? Well, letter or D. D, de next date on the regular meeting. Well, we never came up with a decision on if we're going to meet or not. Well, that's yeah, you're right. Point. So it sounds like, based on our discussion that we've had, we're kind of all set. I think you're all set. Yeah. yeah. Something yeah. comes up, you can always meet. Right. Yeah. So, Jane, you get your wish right now. <laughs> Day off. Oh, boy. Yeah. Okay, last on the list is the manager's items. Uh, which would you like to take first, Bill? Um, the parking enforcement first. Um, this is just a kind of an FYI. I, I doubt anything will come up. There's nothing that can come up as uh, a binding uh, issue at town meeting, but uh, I monitor front porch forum. Um, and there continues to be a lot of talk about parking uh, on Front Porch Forum. And then um, I, I got an email uh, back um, on February 9th from a person who lives over on Randall Street. And he evidently saw one of my responses in front porch form to the parking issue and he said I'm hoping that you can clarify something for me you said that we don't have parking enforcement because the taxpayers haven't improved it fair enough uh, we meaning the town had the same conversation five years ago at a select board meeting and it is what it is I get it nobody wants to increase taxes there's a clearly a divide between the downtown historic district residents and everyone else. Um, I assume he means people in the downtown would like to be some enforcement and everybody else doesn't want to pay for it. And then he goes on to say it's not true that there's no parking enforcement. Uh, this, the ordinance bans parking on the street overnight from uh, November to April from midnight to 6 a.m. And he points out that it's enforced. And I just wanted you to understand it is enforced. Uh, the ordinance that we have, the parking ordinance that the select board adopted after the village went away, incorporated 
elements that were in the old village parking ordinance, one of which was <coughs> overnight parking in the winter on streets. The ordinance gives the manager, the public works director, the highway uh, for person, as well as police officers, the ability to enforce that by having vehicles towed. When we had a police department, on, on nights where it wasn't snowing, if you were out there parked on the street, you'd probably just get a ticket. But on a night like tonight where it's <coughs> snowing, and if it was 2 o'clock in the morning, they, they might have you towed. So we are towing cars. The person who wrote the letter goes on to say that he believes that we should solve the parking problem by simply towing all the cars that are, that are parking longer than the two hours, if they're parking on the places and streets that are um, <coughs> where they shouldn't be. He, he points out Elm Street. Elm Street was a one-lane road from noon until midnight. Cars were parked near the sidewalk on both sides of the road uh, <coughs> into both Main and Randall Street. And he says somebody's going to get injured. Why can't the same company pull cars that are illegally parked as they do for nighttime parking. Now, we don't have that option. The ordinance is not written in that manner. In a daytime fashion? Um, you know, so it's, and, and that's not a good way to enforce parking uh, violations anyway. But I just want to bring it up that, um, you know, the issue is still out there. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure that this is the year that we want to try to enforce this with Main Street being reconstructed and everything else. But as we move into the future, I, you know, it is probably something that will need to be addressed. There was a, did anybody see Alonzo Perry's letter to the editor? Yeah. Um, Kudos to him. <laughs> he, he, he's looking for a job, I guess, you know. Um, <coughs> It was funny, the editor of the newspaper actually sent it to me and said, I think somebody's applying for a job there by writing a letter to us. Here it is. <laughs> so anyway, um, in, in case it comes up at town meeting, I just wanted you to be uh, prepared for it. Um, I doubt anybody's going to make a motion to add money to the budget to hire a parking enforcement officer. I do think probably at some point in time it's something that we need to do. Um, there would be some revenue generated that would offset some of the, the costs of that parking enforcement officer. I was hoping Mark would be here tonight as yeah. a business owner. Uh, but anyway, uh, enough about that. Yeah. Um, <coughs> could, could I add something? I think there's going to be probably a 90% probability that that's going to be discussed in other business. I personally have said this before, all the complaint, you know, I would, if anything, I don't want to see our tax dollars go to an enforcement position, but I think we can have some sort of a, I don't know how it would be done, what the logistics, but some sort of a neighborhood watch, and to me, the first people I'd be looking for, for 10 hours each a week, would be the complainers on, on Frank Porch Forum. And I know that sounds very flip, but I'm very serious about it. Hey, you want to do something about it? You know, go, go, go to town. It's just like, if, if you think there are problems in town, run for, you know, a select board seat, you know, do some, something else. So I think it is important, I, I think we have to have some response, you know, again, because I think the question is going to be asked with how much discussion there has been on French Port Forum. And I just want to commend you. I think you've done a very good diplomatic job responding to these folks. I, I try to stay out of the fray because I probably would get myself in trouble. But you've been very diplomatic about well, your response. Thank you. And, and I don't want to be perceived to be throwing cold water on your idea about volunteerism, Mike. I, I think there is a place for volunteers. I'm not sure um, the, uh, you don't have to be a law enforcement officer to be a parking enforcement officer, yeah, but when you're out there, when you're writing tickets, um, 
there is an opportunity for people to get angry and to get in your face. Um, I'm not sure volunteer uh, ticket writers are really what we want to encourage. Um, I know unless somebody amends the motion, the budget to allow us to hire a parking enforcement officer, which I don't think will happen. Uh, but I think, especially when the Main Street project finishes, it might be something that we have to revisit at some yeah. point. Maybe we should start just at this point with some written warnings to people, <laughs> realizing that there's a two hour um, time limit. I, th I think it sends a real bad message to the business community if we start towing vehicles just for, I know we can, but I think that would just be a stupid thing to do. It, it, would, it would discourage tourism in town. Okay. Well, in, I'll just shove my plug in here. Um, I'm certainly not going to advocate for taxpayers to be footing the bill on, on uh, violators uh, of the parking, parking ordinance. Uh, like I said before, I'm going to push for fees, fines, whatever you want to call them, to equal the cost of having that uh, person on duty to do those, that patrolling. Uh, it's not the innocent taxpayer's responsibility to pay for irresponsible people so I'll leave it at that okay uh, monthly parking our monthly p police reports anyway. so Carla uh, put these at your place uh, we haven't talked about them for a couple of months now um, I did send out an email to Lieutenant White today suggesting first I suggested a day in March the, the uh, third Monday in March for him or the troopers or all of them to come here and address the select board just it's nice every you know once or twice a year to see them so you folks can ask questions and I I purposely suggested March rather than now simply because you know we'll have at least one new select board member in March um, and it's possible that there could be two uh, new poli uh, police officers, select board members, I'm sorry. Um, so anyway, uh, Carla pointed out to me that the meeting on March 16th has a pretty lengthy agenda already um, having to do with Main Street. So um, I, I retracted that invitation and I've asked them maybe to come the first meeting in April. Uh, as we get closer to that, uh, I'll confirm with Lieutenant White, and it will get on the agenda at some point. But um, there's two reports here. One is uh, first and second quarters of 2019. Uh, that's the state's first and second quarters. It's actually of their FY20, which their year goes, their fiscal year goes from July 1st to June 30th. So um, it's our third and fourth quarters. Um, July through December. And you can see that um, they had 685 calls in that period, um, broken down between property incidents, disputes, service assists, traffic incidents. And you can see that the service assists, and I'm not sure everything that goes into service assists, but those are non-criminal um, uh, activities and public information requests uh, both for the July through December and for the January, uh, the month of January, those service assists are quite high in the, the uh, July through December. It's the highest percentage of anything. In the uh, January period, it's close second to traffic incidents at 42%. Um, and the... Um, the amount of um, calls in January at 72 were a little less than the average that we had through uh, July through December. I think that um, is probably pretty typical that uh, there's a lot less traffic on the roads during the winter months and, and uh, you know, they don't have quite as much 
uh, going on as they do in the summer and especially through um, foliage season. Um, they appear to be, um, if you look at the pie chart on the second page, the blue and orange, where um, we see the percentage of calls that are taken by the resident troopers versus the Middlesex troopers in January. It's significantly higher, 62% by the resident troopers to 38%, whereas the six-month period at the, end of July, at the end of 2019 was uh, much more 50-50 with the Middlesex troopers actually taking a, a few more calls. Um, I think that um, can be explained by the fact that the troopers that we have on um, now um, have not been on leave, they haven't been on um, uh, National Guard duty, which happened in the fall and sometimes. So I think they've been on the road uh, more of the time in the, in the recent weeks as opposed to um, what has happened uh, through the last six months of last year. So it's very much a similar pattern to uh, what we've seen over the course of this contract. Um, the, the line chart that's on the third page of the December, uh, July through December, it's a little hard to figure out because the, there's two blue lines that are very similar, but the top line is the total service calls and the bottom blue line is the motor vehicle complaints. Um, and uh, although motor vehicle complaints traffic incidents is 30% of the uh, pie chart, it is kind of the lowest number here, but the other, the other lines kind of meld together in the uh, property disputes and uh, other person disputes. So, um, but I think it would be good to have the troopers or Lieutenant White, uh, hopefully the lieutenant and at least one of the troopers can come to the meeting, but that's their call. Um, I would just remind you, uh, we have from the first of this year, we have 18 months left on this contract. 12 months of 2020 and then the first six months of 2021. So um, it will probably be in the uh, September, October time frame when I reach out to the state to see what their intention is. This, this contract was uh, basically sold as a pilot project with Waterbury uh, and it would be reevaluated <coughs> after the contract period. Um, I know there is a bill in the legislature, Senator uh, White from Windsor County, I believe, Jeanette White. Uh, she has a bill in, uh, if passed, would prohibit the state from entering contracts with municipalities. I saw her at local government day the other day. Um, she told me not to worry about it. It wasn't going anywhere. Nobody else agreed with her, but she's the chairperson of that committee in the Senate. And I, I testified there uh, a couple of years ago before we had this contract and she was advocating against it at that point and I said, well, I don't know why you'd want to tie your hands. Why would you, if, if you don't want to enter into the contract, just say you don't want to enter into the contract, but to put it in law that you can't do it, that, that's a pretty big hurdle to get over if you ever wanted to change your mind. Um, she feels strongly that the sheriffs should do much more policing. And I said, well, depends on what county you're in. Uh, the, nothing against the Washington County Sheriff, but they're not really in the business of wanting to do real police work. They do some traffic control. They do have some small contracts with, they used to have some contracts with the Valley Towns, but that was mainly for traffic control. Uh, they don't do criminal work. Um, and she said, well, we could put it in law that they have to do it. I said, well, again, that, that's, that's a whole different issue. But uh, for right now, 
this works well for Waterbury. I think it works well for the state. Um, and we'd like to see it continue. I, th I think from what I've heard from the board uh, through the contract to this point, that the select board is pretty happy with the current situation and would like to see the contract um, extended if possible when the time comes. If that's different, I know there'll be a different set of people here after the next uh, town meeting, but if that's different, the board should start talking about it sooner rather than later because if we don't, if we can't go forward, it leaves us again with, with nothing and then potentially worse alternatives. So just as we go through the next year, this is something that will percolate to the top uh, as we get toward the end of this year. Has the state um, indicated any kind of an increase potential? No, this, this, this contract was written for a, uh, the set fee. It's 300, it's right. basically it's $1,000 a day, 365,000 um, dollars. And you probably saw in front porch forum, there were some people that were thinking the state was getting rich on this contract and oh my God, this is a huge expense. And then, you know, if you just do a little math and say, okay, the village before it, it went away had two officers and two officers at this rate and the insurance and blah, blah. The village's uh, budget for two officers was almost exactly the same as, as this. And uh, we don't have near the administrative, yeah. uh, I don't want to use the word headaches, yeah. but we don't have the administrative uh, responsibility that we had before. So it's a much, I think it's a much better position for the town to be in right we, now. We also looked, you know, that study committee looked at what other towns were paying, and this is really a good deal for us. I mean, some of these towns are paying a lot more money for their town police yeah. services, and we were on the low end, so I think we're, we're pretty lucky. And there's a lot more fluent connectivity, the fact that we've got the state police, and you know that's what rules the rules the state for the most part. Well, we're lucky too that Middlesex is pretty close. So yeah, that's what I get mean. Get good coverage yeah, on both. Exactly. Anyway, that's all I have, Chris and okay. board. Uh, so the last topic there might kind of put that on the. No, we'll get one more. Oh, we do. Or am I missing monthly Tax police reports? Oh, that's oh, right. Okay. That's, thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, good one, Carla. So this is. Uh, we're getting close to the point in time where we're going to need to do some tax anticipation borrowing just to pay our current expenses for Mike. Um, we don't get any tax money, which is, you know, 85, 90 percent of our revenue until August and then November. And, uh, you know, we use money that's in the bank until we don't have any more and then we've got to borrow money. So we're getting close. I will be working with the with our bank soon to uh, get a line of credit from the bank. But in, the, in years past, I have recommended to the select board and, and the board has agreed uh, where possible to borrow money from EFUD as opposed to the bank. Um, EFUD has some money. They probably don't have quite as much that will take us all the way through to the, to the uh, time when we get taxes in. But um, we pay them about the same interest rate that we pay the bank. It's not a huge savings for the town, but the money does stay local and it benefits them. So I would just uh, like the select board to authorize me uh, when necessary or if necessary to uh, do tax anticipation <coughs> borrowing from the Edward Farrar Utility District. I move that motion. Second that motion. Any further discussion? Just one, which bank do we typically borrow from? 
we do most almost all of our banking from uh, People's United. Yeah. Uh, just a comment, Terry. You, you mentioned, and I was thinking about this today because there was a discussion on on uh, the last talk program there on the radio. The last what? Talk program oh, oh. here. Um, equal time. It revolved around the climate change issue, but one of the discussions was, uh, I believe it was, uh, uh, what do they call the in-state banking system? Public, is it public banking? It's, uh, yeah. yeah. And they had discussed maybe starting something like that at the State House a few years back, if you, were, I don't know if you remember the discussion yeah, about it, yeah. Um, and the gal was saying that if we had that type of system in our states, uh, that you'd have more money to put towards, you know, the interest would go towards uh, helping with the climate issue because of the resource would be there, the additional resource. And it's similar. And I thought about our borrowing from ourselves, you know, uh, it's helped us. Oh, absolutely, through a number of years, and it's been a good thing. So, uh, it's a it's a good example <laughs> of what what could be done. So, that was all I had. Uh, so, motion been made and seconded. I guess uh, all, if all want to approve, say aye. 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 All right. Now the last item on the agenda: uh, paving projects. Um, so the other day I went up to Maggie's Way just to look at uh, a couple of projects that I had talked to people about last year to see if they'd come to fruition or if there are still available projects. And of course when I drove up Maple Street, I really got, and I just kind of putted along. I, I see the state trooper behind me there. Um, he come up behind me there by the town shed and I was just going 20 miles an hour. And uh, he veered off, went up Loomis Hill, and I just continued up Maple Street. But I got to take a pretty good look at the <laughs> condition of that road. I don't know if you've been up it lately, but wow. Uh, but then I turned on to Guild Hill. Um, and I said to myself, holy cow, uh, even this road has, for the short per time period that it's been paved, has started to show some pretty reasonable uh, degradation. Especially on the downhill yeah, side. Yeah, yeah. It's, that one <clears throat> spring area is the problematic spot. Yep. I noticed it the other day. A lot of spider cracking there um, on the flat area before you get to, um, I forget the old man's name there that owned that white, night, white, nice white house in the, the red barn there. Um, but anyway, the road in it itself is, is starting to deteriorate fairly quickly. Uh, and then the other day I had to deliver a machine up to Perry Lee and the only way I could get there was the paved hill because there wasn't, um, the conditions weren't right on the dirt road for me to haul my truck and trailer. Uh, so I had to, I went up and checked the paved section of Perry Hill and it was pretty much bare. But even the upper part of that is just crumbling to no end. A um, lot of big heaves in it. and just really falling apart. And I know that that project has, it's on its what, fifth year or maybe six. Um, I don't remember exactly. So I started to become frustrated um, with the fact that we've tried to make, you know, substantially bigger steps towards recovering our paved road problems, and it seems like it's a losing battle. And uh, so I called up Mike and said, do you want to take a little short trip and take a look at some of our failing paved infrastructure? Uh, so we did. We took a little drive today, and, and uh, I went down and visited High Street, because I hadn't been there in a while. and. Of course, he was with me, and uh, of course, the minute you turn onto High Street, you can visually see the difference in the asphalt color being one, uh, 
and then a condition two of those two sections, one with the foam and one without. And we actually went up and got out of the vehicle and uh, walked and talked a little bit. Um, I know that I explained to Mike kind of what took place at on High Street, uh, experimental effort, which resulted in the use of sheet foam and using Hamilton Engineering's specifications of going down two feet, um, which ended up, you know, kind of biting us in the ass because it got into soils that were far inferior than what they anticipated and the result was additional costs. Um, so having explained to him uh, the uh, benefits to spray foam versus sheet foam, uh, we talked a little bit and at some point before paving projects begin, maybe the town would consider an experimental section of road using she, uh, spray foam uh, at a lot less depth than what was done on High Street uh, just to get some form of a cost comparison as to how it will fare out. Uh, because I, I really, after my personal drive and then the drive we took today, I'm more convinced that if we can somehow try to make efforts uh, to, to eliminate the problem that's causing so much cost and destruction to our roads that we should consider it. So that's kind of the whole gist of my conversation. Yeah, and, and I mean, my, I'm not here to to speak for or against what your proposal is. You're the select board and you can, you know, dictate what will happen. Um, and again, not making any value judgments, that's fine. We have a certain amount of money set aside for paving. We want to do certain segments of road. And if we do foam, the money is going to run out before the, the, the pavement is going to be done. So um, that's perfectly fine. Uh, if, if that's what the board decides to do, I think it would be good to talk with Woody and Alec as we get closer to the time when we're going to do it uh, to see you know, if we're going to choose a segment of road, uh, when does it make sense, um, you know, where does it make sense, in places that we don't have water and sewer lines underneath, maybe those are the places that make most sense to use it because there's less of a, a chance that you're going to have to dig it up for something. You're only going to have to dig it up for a culvert. Uh, whereas, you know, it's one of the reasons why we were even skeptical on High Street. I know we had to do the foam board as opposed to the spray foam because of the timing and the whole nine yards. but when you put that foam on top of roads where you've got old water and sewer mains, you may end up having to dig through it. But it all comes down to money. It's, it's the kind of pay me now, pay me later philosophy. And if you want to put foam underneath, just understand you're going to pave less length of road. Sure. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have an idea how much more expensive it is? 20%? You know, I had those numbers at one time, Jane, um, but they kind of got lost in the, in the, yeah. Um, you know, to my recollection, spray foam is about anywhere from $2.50 to $3 a square foot. Um, that's just a number that's been in the back of my head for a long time. And the reason I say $3 a square foot, because it was closer to Two to two fifty a few years back, so I suspect you know it may have increased a little bit. Um, so the rest of it is you know something that probably can be fairly easily figured out. Um, but uh, what I was going to suggest, uh, if the board is interested, we'd have to warn the meeting, but maybe perhaps after the new board's established. 
uh, after town meeting, um, while we still have plenty of frost in the ground, that we take a site visit and uh, talk about this and, and look at the conditions of the roads. Uh, you know, High Street, the section that was done with foam, even though it did cost extra money because of the issue that they ran into, uh, which I believe I believe could have been eliminated. Uh, that road hasn't budged. That section has not moved. I did point out, as I did when I went to the village of Essex, they had a, a section of road that was 12 years old, and the only crack in that road was where there was a manhole cover, and the only crack in High Street was where there was a uh, uh, shut water off valve. for a water valve, and then the crack only was a foot and a half on either side, and it's simply because that's the weak point in the road. Uh, there was no heaving at all. It was just a stress crack, uh, which is typical. But other than that, that road has not moved a fraction. Uh, I'm far from a road expert, but I am a good money guy, and I know what expenses are. And, and I'm not saying, as I know Bill, you may have alluded, maybe we need to do some test sections, you know, to see what, what foam can do. I think from what I saw in High Street, not only will we benefit, you know, it's gonna cost more, but in the long run, it's gonna benefit us in less maintenance costs. And, you know, in terms of even, plowing and stuff like that we're going to get better plowing um it's going to be more effective and just less maintenance so if you look at the cost after those things are taken out the higher cost starts getting mitigated you know i know we have a lot of paving work to do and i don't i'm not saying let's just go foam whole hog but i think we should at least look at a, maybe a couple of sections and see what the yeah. results are. And that's, that's where we're going, not saying let's just turn on a dime, but let's see the results in at least a couple of years. And, you know, what Chris was saying is the, the Essex Public Works Department decreased their expenditures for road maintenance significantly. That they, they're they talking about not replacing roads for 15, 20 years, you know, where we're probably doing it on a, you know, what, a seven year cycle or so? Well, if we were lucky, we'd be doing that, it. I'm, 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 I was being, yes, yeah. if we're lucky that we could get away with seven years. But if, we, you know, the economics of spending more to get a product that will work, will work 15 to 20 yeah, years. I, I, and and I, I, we can't equate Essex Junction or Essex Town with Waterbury, they're two different. We have probably two to three weeks more of winter, so there are some, at least, I'm being kind. Well, I mean, and I, I get it all, and if Chris's number is right, you know, $3 a square foot, if you have a 25-foot section of road 1,000 feet long, that's $75,000 yeah. to, to do that. And, you know, I can't remember what asphalt was last year, but, you know, if it's a uh, hundred dollars a ton, you know that's seven hundred and fifty tons of asphalt, and I don't know how how far that that could go. So it's a, it's a trade off. But I think if you want to test it, I'm I'm not opposed to testing. Um, I think that if we decide to do it, I think there has to be some judiciousness as to where we do it. I'm not sure we can, you know, do the whole length of Perry Hill, for example. Right, I mean, maybe you want to, but uh, you know, you're going to spend, you're going to spend we'll five, away. ten we'll years we'll worth of paving to do that. Money. So this may sound like a hypothetical uh, wish, I guess. But well, let's say, let's say that. Uh, and this is how I think sometimes, you know, people probably look at me and go, this guy's not playing with a full deck, but let's say we were able to establish some test sections uh, with spray foam and it works and it's successful. Uh, 
let's say our beloved Congress, United States Congress, decides to put forward uh, an infrastructure bill of trillion or two trillion dollars, whatever they've been batting the ball around about. Um, and we have a scenario in place that works for solving our frost problems. Conceivably, could we get funding if we got Mr. Welch and Mr. Leahy and whoever's going to replace Bernie? Uh, <laughs> Uh, together to say we've solved this problem. Uh, now we need the funding for it. Uh, never hurts to ask. Never hurts to ask. So it's things like that that you can, uh, you know, try to make happen and just kind of like the community center, you know. Yeah. You don't know until you ask. Okay. Uh, anybody else? So. We'll consider a site visit after a town meeting at some point here when the new board gets established and uh, take a look at that. And uh, other than that, I'll take a motion to adjourn and we'll see you at town meeting. So moved. Okay. Thanks. Second. Yep.